look at, at different times in Earth history. So that is one, this pattern of deep time and change. And then you have population genetics, stuff like uh, origin of, of resistant, drug resistance in, in microbes, uh, which show that uh, uh, tiny changes in the genome can, can spread in a population. That is called uh, microevolution, what you see in the fossil record. These large changes over a long time are called macroevolution. And the claim is if you interpolate this microevolution that you can observe in the laboratory, if you raise bacteria and, and use drugs on them, and they, they develop resistance, if you would look at this for millions and billions of years, then you would get microevolution. That is the claim. Now, actually, when you really combine these two disciplines, what you find is that the fossil record, if you accept the dating methods, establishes uh, uh, certain windows of time that are available for certain transitions. For example, in Wales, you have this transition from ancestors that looked like roughly like a wild boar uh, to animals that already looked like a dolphin. And the available window of time to make this transition is about four and a half million years, which sounds a lot, but is not more than the lifespan of a single larger mammal species. So to, to make this transition from a wild boar-like animal to a dolphin-like animal, you have just one species in succession available, which is of course impossible. So if you can really do the math and can use the formula of population genetics to calculate the necessary genetic changes and uh, you have certain waiting times for changes to occur in a population depending on the size of the population and you have a waiting time for mutations to spread in the population. Of course every change has to occur in all members of a new species. And these two waiting times together, if you calculate them, you consistently arrive at waiting times that are 10 times longer than the available windows of time in the fossil record. That is the so-called waiting time problem and it is unsolved by mainstream evolutionary biology. Now, we have already talked about fossils now. Now uh, we will go to my field of expertise, the fossil record and paleontology. And there it's important to, to realize that every theory makes certain predictions. And these predictions you can test empirically, you can ask questions at nature and then look what gives nature as answers to your questions. And uh, Darwinism, the theory of evolution, makes one crucial prediction and that is gradualism. That you have these tiny steps that over a long time make big changes and that it's a gradual, continuous process, not big jumps, because big jumps, saltations, that would be like divine miracles. And therefore, it's not only Darwin who emphasized this gradualism and said, natura non facet saltus, a Latin sentence which means nature doesn't make jumps in his uh, book, Origin of Species. But even Richard Dawkins, uh, 2009, in his famous book, The Greatest Show on Earth, wrote evolution not only is a gradual process as a matter of fact, it has to be gradual if it is to do any explanatory work. And that means if we can test if this process in Earth history, the, the history of life is gradual or not, we can test if this prediction of Darwinism is fulfilled or not. And actually it's not fulfilled and Darwin was already aware of this. And uh, when I later show you a lot of discontinuities in the fossil record, and I will tell you something like it took 5 million years or only 10 million years, you may think this is a long time because our own history uh, is just the written history, just a few thousand years. Uh, but 10 million years, usually if you look at paleontology textbooks, 5 to 10 million years is the lifespan of a single species, as I already mentioned. So a window of time of 5 million years, that is an abrupt change in terms of the theory of evolution. So what is the usual explanation for discontinuities? And as I said, Darwin was already aware that the fossil record doesn't confirm his theory. And the usual explanation is that people say, well, these discontinuities are not real, they are just gaps of evidence. It's the incompleteness of the fossil record. 
And Philip Gingrich, a famous vertebrate paleontologist, once said, gaps of evidence are gaps of evidence and not evidence of gaps. Is this true? We can test this, actually. And, and my colleague, a philosopher of science, Paul Nelson, made a wonderful analogy how we can test it. Imagine you develop a new hobby, and the hobby is beachcombing. You walk along the seashore and you collect uh, shells, mussels, uh, snails, starfish, whatever you find uh, on the beach, what the flood washes in. And when you start this hobby, every day you find something new. But the longer you do it, the more days you walk along the beach and you collect everything you find, things start to repeat and you find the same things over and over again. And at a certain point, maybe you are surprised you find the first message in a bottle or a piece of driftwood from, a, from an ancient ship. But more or less, you find the same stuff over and over again. And then you know that you have sampled enough what is out there to know what is still lacking, is really lacking, is, and is not a gap of evidence, but is evidence of a gap, something that is not there. So then you have reached a point of saturation where what is lacking is not an artifact of so-called undersampling. And the same is done in paleontology. And in paleontology, you can test the incompleteness of the fossil record by something that is called the collector curve. The collector curve is this S-like structure you see here, and here you have coordinates, and the coordinate here, the horizontal axis, is the effort you have to invest to find something new. You can calculate this in uh, time you have to invest to dig fossils or in grant money you have to invest whatever you want to use as me measure for, for the energy you have to invest to find something new. You can put here and in the vertical axis you have the newly discovered species or new types of organisms uh, that you find in the fossil record. And at the beginning you have this deep curve and you find a lot of new stuff. You dig a little hole here and you dig a little hole there and you find new dinosaurs and new stuff. But at a certain point when you have collected enough, this curve flattens. And then you reach this point of saturation and you need a lot of energy, a lot of time, a lot of paleontologists doing digging all over the world to find something significantly new, otherwise you find the same stuff over and over again. And then you know you have sampled enough fossils to know what has been living in past ages and uh, what's lacking is not lacking because you haven't looked hard enough. And this has been tested statistically for all ages of, of Earth history, for all different groups of organisms, for all different ge uh, geographical regions. There's a famous paper by Foot and Sipkowski and, and Nature uh, from 1999. And the general result is we find that completeness is rather high for many animal groups. So in most groups we know that we have sufficiently collected to know that the discontinuities that we find are really out there. So what discontinuities do we find that refute Darwinism? One discontinuity we find, uh, or failed predictions, is so-called ghost lineages. And what's ghost lineages? What you see here is a tree, a phylogenetic tree, an ancestry tree of mammal orders. Mammal orders are the large groups of mammals like elephants and rodents and primates and bats and carnivores uh, and so on, horses. And this tree shows the inferred relationship based on the most modern, from 2016, genomic studies, comparison of the genomes. That would result, that would be the branching pattern that would result from these genome analysis. And here you have horizontally the time axis, and the point where the, the branching is put is calculated by the so-called molecular clock, where you assume that this clock of mutation ticks at a certain rate and then you can calculate back by comparing the branches and then you have datings for the branching points. So for example, this branching would have been something like 90 million years ago. But what I did here is I plotted the actual first fossil records of the groups that are the red dots on this tree. And what you find is that in all modern mammal orders you find in this very narrow window of time 
uh, all the first fossil records more or less synchronously at the same time suddenly appearing out of nowhere. And there are no red dots here where they should be. So all these branches and these uh, 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 lines uh, which uh, represent ancestral populations, they are just theoretically inferred, but they are not corroborated by the fossil record. So if you compare molecular data for the branchings, uh, the reconstructed trees and the actual fossil record, you see a large conflict. And this is found everywhere. Whichever group you look at, you find this conflict between fossil data and molecular data. So there is a clear refutation of, of, of the prediction by Darwinism, because Darwinism will predict that these two lines of evidence, fossil record and molecular data, would basically agree and come to the same result. But the discontinuities I mentioned, they go through the whole history of life and we can start again with the origin of life 4.1 billion years ago. That is at the very first moment where life would be possible according to the standard scenario of Earth history. We already have evidence here, you have all the recent finds of, of oldest organisms, either direct fossil-like microfossils or indirect evidence for life. And it originates at the very first moment uh, where it's possible because there's a phenomenon called the late heavy bombardment that is a very early time in Earth history where Earth was hit by a lot of large meteorites and there was a, a, a paper recently in Nature in 2014 which said existing oceans would have repeatedly boiled away into steam atmospheres as a result of large collisions as late as about 4 billion years ago. So before life would have been impossible and when it's possible, boom, it's there. Not a gradual process, but right at the very first moment you find Origin, uh, you find evidence of life. And the same with photosynthesis, and we have already seen this picture of this protein that is involved in photosynthesis, but that's just one of many. You need for, for this very complex process of metabolism, how plants create uh, 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 energy from sunlight. And we meanwhile have evidence for photosynthesis 3.8 billion years ago, that is the end of the late heavy bombardment, when the oceans could persist and when you could have algae in the oceans that could do photosynthesis and boom, this complex process is immediately there. You would expect, according to Darwin's theory, that you would find something like this very late in the history of life, maybe in the tertiary some million years ago, but not at the very beginning. Then you have, uh, we can, can drop this, we can right go to the first macro fossils. So the first fossils that everybody would recognize as something that is not a random pattern in the rocks, something like here, uh, impressions from organisms. And the first uh, things you find are uh, found in the so-called Ibiakaran age, that's about 570 million years ago, according to standard dating, and the origin of these life forms has been called the Avalon explosions because they appear very suddenly within a 10 million year window of time. Remember, that's just the lifespan of a single marine invertebrate species and you find these strange organisms, you cannot say plants or, or animals because nobody knows what they really are. They are very different from everything we find today or later in the history of life. They are they are not bilateral symmetrical, they have not a mirror symmetry, they are slightly shifted left right, they have a fractal growth, they, they have a structure like an air mattress, uh, they have no visible inner organs, so they are completely enigmatic, they are certainly not ancestral to later uh, forms of life, but they appear out of nowhere without transition, no gradual building process of their body plants, they appear they stay for a while and they, then they disappear. The same in the Cambrian, the famous Cambrian explosion that has been called in, in the title of Time magazine, Evolution's Big Bang. There we have also in a short window of time of, of 20 million years, the appearance of 21 of the 28 known animal phyla. And the animal phyla are the basic body plants, something like a mollusk. 
or something like a vertebrate or something like a starfish. Right? So these very different organizations, either segmented or unsegmented, soft-bodied or with the exoskeleton, uh, or, or with uh, complex eyes or with lens eyes, so very different body plans. They appear out of nowhere in the so-called Cambrian explosions. Here you see some fossils, either from the famous Burgess Trail in Canada or from the Shenyang uh, locality in China. Evolutionists tried to explain away uh, these fossils and they said, well, it's just an artifact because there, there were no localities before that could preserve them. This has been refuted in recent years. We have found uh, localities that have exactly the same type of preservation, like for example the Burgess Trail from the Idyakaran, and what we find there is just algae, but no animals at all. And meanwhile, experts agree that they are not there in the fossil record because they didn't exist before the Cambrian. So they appear suddenly in the Cambrian. We can drop this and go right to the next explosive event in the next age, in the so-called Ordovician age. And uh, this is about 470 million years ago, according to standard dating. And this event is not as well known as the Cambrian explosion, but it has been called life's second Big Bang. And it's, the experts call it the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, or GOBI. And here you have a very short window of time of again uh, just uh, 10 to 20 million years, a sudden burst of biodiversity of marine invertebrates from just very few alien looking forms to the diversity of, of corals, of mussels, of, of uh, brachiopods, uh, these, these uh, shell-like animals. Uh, they don't appear gradually, they appear suddenly in the fossil record against the prediction of Darwinism. Then you have something similar at the transition from the next uh, geological ages, the Silurian to the Devonian. That is about 427 million years ago, when the first land plants appeared. And the first land plants, the oldest one we know is Baragranatia from the late Silurian, is already belonging to a modern subgroup of mosses, to the group of club mosses. It's not a primitive pre-plant, it's, it's already, you can put it in the modern system of plants. And uh, there has been a publication in 1998 which concluded this uh, primary radiation of land biota is the terrestrial equivalent of the much debated Cambrian explosion of marine fauna. So in plant origin of land plants, you find the same phenomenon like in marine animals, sudden burst of diversity, sudden appearance, no gradual transition. Then in the Devonian age, you find something that has only recently been described by a study friend of mine, Christian Krug, 2010, the Devonian Necton Revolution. If you look at the life in the ocean, you have three different ways animals can live. They can live close to the sea floor. This would be this brown uh, part in this diagram. Uh, this is called the demersial. Or they can drift passively in the water. That is called plankton. That would be the green here in the diagram. Or they can be active swimmers, like, for example, fish or, or uh, uh, octopuses. That is called nectar. And you see here in the Devonian, here horizontally we have the time axis, here you have the percentage, how many percent of marine life are living like plankton, how many live uh, close to the sea floor, and how many are active swimmers. You find in a 10 million year window of time from just a few percent uh, active swimmers before suddenly you have 80, 90 percent active swimmers as part of the biosystem in the marine ecosystems. So again, a sudden transition, an abrupt transition, not a gradual transition. And correlated with this is the origin of first tooth structures in fish. We can jump over this. In my own uh, field of expertise, fossil insects, uh, you find here in this diagram vertically the time axis and here you find the different insect orders that would be orders would be something like beetles and then you have 600,000 species of beetles and butterflies and then you have 150,000 species of butterflies and dragonflies and mayflies and bugs and so on. And they all appear in the Carboniferous suddenly out of nowhere without 
precursors. All those weird <coughs> insects, they just are there and they are more or less looking like today. It's not just primitive uh, flying insects like dragonflies or roaches or, or locusts, but even highly developed uh, uh, insects like uh, first wasps, first beetles, first scorpionflies will already have this very complex metamorphosis. Uh, they appear already uh, 320 million years ago in the Carboniferous, suddenly without gradual transition. And in the next age, uh, that, that lasts till 250 million years ago in the Triassic, we find a real carpet bonding of, of such explosive events, which has been called by a total anti-creationist, Peter Ward. He made famous debates with uh, intelligent design proponents. He's an evolutionist. He said what occurred in the Triassic was as important for animal life on land as the Cambrian explosion was for marine animal life. Again, the same pattern, discontinuity, all the different groups, the first dinosaurs, the first turtles, the first lizard likes, the first crocodile relatives, the first mammals, they all appear in just a 10 million year window of time, just the lifespan of one or two vertebrate species in the tri Triassic. And one very striking example, if you look at marine reptiles, uh, just before the Triassic you had zero reptile families living in marine environments and then suddenly within just a few million years you find 15 different families, this kind of diversity of fish-like, crocodile-like animals, turtle-like animals, the, the plesiosaurs, very weird looking like animals like this, giraffe-necked, canistrophides, and uh, the transition that is available to get from a lizard-like assumed ancestor to a fish-like ichthyosaur, which looks like a dolphin or like a shark, is again just four or five million years. So again, lifespan just of a single species. Abrupt appearance, they are there, boom, out of nowhere. The same with flyers and gliders. In just a two million years window of time, you find different forms of gliders who glide with their hind wings or with rib-like processes, or also the first active flyers, the first pterosaurs in the mid-Triassic. Dinosaurs appear explosively. There is a recent paper, 2018, in Nature Communications, which said, Explosive increase in dinosaurian abundance. It's amazing how clear cut the change from no dinosaurs to all dinosaurs was. That is recent evidence by evolutionists. Same with mosasaurs, same with flowering plants. Uh, Darwin was aware of this and called it the abominable mystery because it conflicted with his gradualistic expectations. And a paper in 2015 said, then about 125 million years ago, angiosperms and their flowers sprang forth during the Cretaceous period as fully formed as Aphrodite. Here's a fossil, for example, fossil water lily, 115 million years old. Butterflies appear suddenly at the lower tertiary without precursors. Modern birds appear, the whole diversity of modern birds appears in a very short 10 million year window of time at the lower tertiary. The same with placental mammals. All these orders we have seen the diagram uh, before up here. Here you see the oldest bats. We have the oldest fossils, the first fossils we have, and here's the skeleton of a modern bat, and you see no difference. They, uh, the, they, the first ones look like modern ones, and they even had echolocation. And e even if we look at our own genus, the genus Homo, there has been a study in 2000, which was called New Study Suggests Big Bang Theory of Human Evolution. And the, this is an evolutionist paper. John Hawkes is one of the most famous paleoanthropologists working on the evolution of man from ape-like ancestors. And his result in 2000 was, in some of the earliest Homo sapiens remains differ significantly from Australopithecines. Australopithecines are these ape-like forms like Lucy in both size and anatomical details. In so far as we can tell, the changes were sudden and not gradual. So that is not stuff that creationists say or intelligent design proponents say. That is the result from modern <coughs> paleontology research. And even the origin of our culture is not gradual. It is called the Upper Paleolithic Human Revolution because in a short window of time in the Upper Paleolithic, you find all the different 
behaviors uh, which point to symbolic thinking like carving of, of ivory, uh, uh, cave paintings and so on. So again, not a gradual transition. Now something different, uh, a different prediction that is not fulfilled by the fossil record is that uh, over millions of years you find an accumulation of change because you have many organisms that stay for hundreds of millions of years the same and they are not for nothing called living fossils. You all heard about them and you know examples like the uh, Latimeria, the, the, these low-thin fish or the, the Sylacant or here the uh, Sphenodon, uh, a, a lizard from New Zealand or the Nautilus which looks like uh, its fossil representatives or the ginkgo tree which exactly looks like uh, fossils. And one of the most striking examples for the, these animals that are left behind by time is horseshoe crabs. What you see here in the photo is a recent horseshoe crab. Also here, this brown drawing is the recent horseshoe crab Limonus polyphemus. What you see here, and it is one to one exactly the same as Limonus Darwini from the late Jurassic, it's 150 million years older and it is identical. But even if you go further in time to a quarter billion years and you go to Tunisia and the Mid-Triassic Limonitella Ariensis, it's 244 million years ago and it still looks exactly the same. And even if you go back nearly a half billion years to the oldest known horseshoe crabs, they almost look identical to the modern ones. So they have not changed. So what do evolutionists say about this? How do they explain why did they stay? Why could they survive and not change? And other animals like trilobites went extinct, even though they were much more diverse and they, they, we know 70,000 species of them. They lived in all different kind of biotopes, but still they went extinct and uh, horseshoe crab survived. Now the usual answer by evolutionists is uh, that natural selection is the answer. Natural selection can be transformative when the uh, uh, ecological conditions, the surroundings, uh, change, but if nothing in the ecosystem changes, then natural selection is the opposite, it's stabilizing. So it's like a magic wand, wand or you can say it's uh, 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 explaining everything, it's explaining change and it's also explaining no change. But is this really convincing that this survival without change of horseshoe crab is due to a non-changing environment, to, to niches in the uh, ecosystem that stayed for a half billion years. If you look at the time axis <coughs> over whole, the whole time where horseshoe crab existed, all the five major mass extinctions and each of these mass extinctions saw a loss of 50 to 90 percent of the marine biodiversity and also several of the explosions which completely changed marine ecosystems they all happened in this time is it really convincing that they could stay the same without changing because the ecosystem stayed the change while around them everything was dying and then there were explosions of change ecosystem but they stayed the same and didn't have to change that's simply not convincing and therefore the final uh, resort for evolutionists is to say well it's just dumb luck uh, so, uh, evolution is like a big lottery game and there are some lucky winners and then there are dumb losers so the trilobites were the unlucky losers and horseshoe crab were the lucky winners but the problem is that scientists themselves say that evolution is not a contingent process. It's not simply random. And the evidence for this is the phenomenon of convergence, that we find the same solutions over and over again, that we find complex eyes in more origin, originated more than 40 different times independently, that bioluminescence, uh, organisms that can make light originated 23 times independently, which suggests that there are certain solutions that are constrained by certain patterns that are given by nature and that it's not just uh, uh, either you win or you lose. Uh, and, uh, there, there is a certain pattern that you can observe and contingency is not a valid explanation to say why horseshoe crabs uh, could stay the same without change, changing and uh, trilobites were just dumb losers and went extinct. Uh, if 
Compound eyes or complex eyes can originate 40 times independently. Why did some organisms develop solutions that could survive and others not? If, uh, if they are so constrained, these solutions, and they are found independently over and over again, why are only some plants poisonous and uh, to protect themselves against predators and not all of them? So, finally, the final prediction of Darwinism that is not confirmed by the fossil record, Darwin predicts gradual species to species transitions. So not only a gradual transition, let's say, from slime to us, but also gradual transition from one uh, mouse to another mouse species. And actually, if you look at the fossil record, you hardly find any examples for such species-to-species -species transitions. But paleontologists said, well, that's the incompleteness of the fossil record. Again, this exp explanation. But actually, there are some layers where you have, over a long time, sediments uh, that are undisturbed and where you can uh, look at, uh, for example, protozoan organisms like these foraminifera. They are marine unicellular organisms which have an exoskeleton, a very beautiful uh, little beast. And uh, the only two or three examples that exist for alleged gradual species to species transitions are either from such foraminifera or they are from snails. But actually, in the last years, all these examples that you find in the textbooks as fossil evidence for Darwin's gradual species to species transitions have been refuted. So the most famous textbook example is a transition from two foraminiferans from the genus Globulotalia, these are Tumida species, to the species Tumida, which you see here in this uh, uh, SEM photo. But recently there has been a paper, 2009, in the famous journal PNAS, and the title says everything. Evidence for abrupt speciation in a classic case of gradual evolution. This example has been shot down by new research. And the same with the only other example for gradual species to species transition, and it has been developed by Franz Hilgendorf in the 19th century. He made the first uh, phylogenetic tree based on fossil fossils, and he did it with fossil snails from the Steinheim basin in Germany. And there has been early critique that these, this uh, uh, tree of gradual transitions of different snail species actually is not a tree of different species, but that they are all belonging to the same species as, and are simply representing different ecophenotypes. And ecophenotypes means that members of the same species can look differently in different parts of the same lake, or depending if there is a hot summer or a cold winter, then they change the shape of their shell like you find some plants when there is a cold uh, season, they are growing more tiny and have different leaves than when there is a good year and they are growing bigger. And this early critique has recently been confirmed by a study of uh, these snails that still exist, the same genus still exists, and they have been studied in deep lakes at the roof of the world, at, at Tibet, and what the study found is exactly that you find all these different alleged species as members of the same species in these Tibetan lakes. So they are just ecophenotypes. It's no gradual species to species transition. Also, this example has been shot down just recently in 2015. So what I've told you now is this just all just propaganda from intelligent design proponents and creationists? No, actually, I participated at a, a conference in 2016 in London, <clears throat> and it was a conference organized by the Royal Society of London, the most prestigious scientific society in the world. Uh, Newton was one of its first presidents, and uh, it was a completely mainstream evolutionary biologist uh, uh, conference called New Trends in Evolutionary Biologies, Biology. And the keynote presentation was done by one of the most famous theoretical evolutionary biologists still living, that is Professor Gerd Müller from Austria. And he showed this slide, and probably it's too small for you to read, so I read it for you what he showed in his keynote. He showed a slide called Explanatory Deficits of the MS Theory, which means Explanatory Deficits of the Modern Synthesis Theory, also known as Neo-Darwinism. 
So what neo-Darwinism cannot explain. And then he lists phenotypic complexity, so complex organs, phenotypic novelty, the origin of new biological forms, new body plans, and non-gradual forms of transition, what we have seen, these discontinuities in the fossil record. Hell no, this is everything that is interesting in evolution. If neo-Darwinism cannot explain this, then it cannot explain anything, and that is acknowledged by the leading theoretical evolutionary biologists. And it's not just at this conference, there was a second conference this year in Austria, 2018, uh, organized by the New York Academy of Sciences in Salzburg called Evolution, Genetic Novelty, Genomic Variations by RNA Networks and Viruses, totally mainstream. And what you find on the conference website is the following. For more than a half century, it has been accepted that new genetic information is mostly derived from random error-based events. Random error-based events, mutations. Now it is recognized that errors cannot explain genetic novelty and complexity. That is an official declaration of death for neo-Darwinism. And of course, evolutionists don't give up. They don't say, okay, now we believe in God. They try to find new, highly speculative ideas to, to fill this gap. None of these ideas has yet shown its explanatory scope and power to solve the, this crucial problem of the origin of biological novelty and complexity. And uh, we intelligent design proponents will predict we will wait 10, 10 more years and then all these alternative approaches will have failed as well. And what then? What next? So, as last slide, many of our opponents uh, will say, well, you commit the so-called Sherlock Holmes fallacy. You say, you just critique neo-Darwinism and you so show the weaknesses of this theory, but that doesn't mean that intelligent design or creation wins by default. This would be really a fallacy if uh, you would make this argument in this way, but the argument is a different one. The argument which you find in this famous Sherlock Holmes novel is that Sherlock Holmes said, when you exclude all other options, then whatever remains, even if it sounds implausible, must be the truth. So the question is, is neo-Darwinism the only naturalistic option or are there many others? Have we just shot down one of many naturalistic alternatives? Then we haven't refuted evolution. But I Darwinism is the only available naturalistic option. Humanity in 2000 years of science and philosophy has never come up with a different idea how you can build information with a bottom-up mechanistic process. So Darwin's idea was in a way was a very good idea to this random variation and natural selection and it was not for nothing called by a famous atheist Daniel Dennett called Darwin's dangerous idea and as a universal acid that eats away all metaphysics and religion and Richard Dawkins said Darwin has made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist because he's aware if Darwinism fails then uh, there is no other explanation for the diversity and complexity of life and therefore critiquing and refuting neo-Darwinism actually is equivalent to positively established intelligent design. Okay, that was my talk. Now I'm looking forward to your questions and hopefully we'll have some answers to them. Thank you. Switch of right. screen yes. sharing. Can you see me again? Yes. yes. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Bickley. Maybe we'll give you a couple of minutes to catch your breath and read the questions we... Uh... Let's have a little water <laughs> and yeah. then I'm ready for questions. So, uh, again, if you have questions, you may forward them uh, to the uh, link that Liam uh, forwarded to us. Uh, I think the lessons to me, there are two main lessons. Number one, when we hear in universities or at work that it's established, this evolution is established, we need to think again, read and examine for ourselves as Dr. Bickley showed us. Number two, we have unfailing truth in the Bible that will cover the past 
the current and the future as well. This is our backbone, this is the foundation of our field that does not change with different scientific theories that started in 100, 100 years ago or might come again in 20, 50 years or whatever. So uh, we have uh, half an hour uh, questions with Dr. Bickley. I think we have already sent him a few questions that will take uh, some time. You have them, Dr. Bickley? Yes, I, I got four questions, so I will just go through them in order. So the first question I received is, what do you think about the various experiments that showed that proteins, nucleic acids, etc., can be made in a lab setting? Now, there, there are several things to be said uh, to this. First is, it's not really true that proteins have been made in a lab setting in a way that resembles a potential origin of these proteins, let's say, in a prebiotic soup at the beginning of Earth history. What has been done in the lab is actually intelligent design of proteins, so it needed a very large input of, of highly sophisticated genetic engineering to build completely new proteins in the lab. It first was successful in 2011, and it was only successful in a few cases since then, and none of these lab-generated proteins originated by a mechanistic random process, like uh, uh, it could be built, let's say, in a kind of warm pond, as Darwin imagined at the beginning of life. They were engineered, so these proteins in the lab are actually approved for intelligent design, not for, for evolution. And the second that has to be said for this is that Protein is not the same as protein. As we heard before, uh, you have in the sequence space of proteins, you have a lot of proteins that are not giving biological functions. What you need is a protein that folds in a very complex three-dimensional way. And it, actually the problem in engineering proteins, new proteins that don't, don't exist in nature in the lab is that we don't have the computing power yet to predict if you just have a random se uh, uh, given sequence, let's say you engineer a new sequence of amino acids, that you can do actually with modern genetic engineering. You can just uh, build a kind of amino acid sequence, but you cannot predict from your drawing board if this sequence will fold in this three-dimensional way, will it give any kind of biological function or not. So uh, what people do is they take certain families of proteins and they just tweak these existing families of proteins a little bit uh, to change them a bit, but they have a starting point and already working protein. So uh, the second point was nuclear acids. Uh, they have been made in the, the laboratory. Actually, all uh, you probably heard about this famous Miller-Urey experiment in school where they tried to simulate this kind of prebiotic soup and they put kind of electric uh, uh, lightnings into the, this chemix and they produced nucleic acids and it was called that's uh, uh, simulating the origin of life. That is like you would say we have explained the origin of Shakespeare's Hamlet because in the lab we could generate something that looks like ink drops. Uh, of course, if you have some ink drops, you haven't explained the origin of a book or of Hamlet. And the same is with nucleic acids. They are just building blocks. They have nothing to do with these uh, molecular machines uh, that you need for the first cell, even if you just have a bacterial cell. So that is simply overblown results. There is nothing remotely resembling anything, not only like a cell, but even a first replicator let's say a self-replicating RNA molecule, nothing like that has been created in a kind of prebiotic experiment uh, in the lab. So these are overblown claims that you find in textbooks, but uh, there is no real uh, laboratory explanation for the origin of life or even of, of proteins. So the next question I received is, we were told that bacterial resistance to antibiotics proves evolution. What's your view on that? My view on that is, yes, it proves evolution. Uh, 
And uh, it proves evolution if you accept, accept a relatively a meaningless definition of evolution, which you often find in textbooks, and this definition of evolution is evolution is change of gene frequency, which means you have in every population of organisms, let's say, let's take these famous butterflies, you have different genes, some genes for bright butterflies, some genes for dark butterflies, and if you put as adaptational pressure, for example, predators, then uh, the frequency of those butterflies that have better camouflage will increase and the frequency of the genes that give the butterflies color that makes them more easily visible to predators will decrease in, in frequency. But both of these genes already existed before. This does not explain how you get these genes for having light or dark butterflies in the first place and it doesn't explain how you get butterflies in the first place. So. If you accept this definition, which is used for microevolution, and microevolution like drug resistance and antibiotics isn't even disputed, let's say, by, by fundamentalist, young earth creationist organizations like Answers in Genesis, they will happily acknowledge that you can in the lab uh, observe microevolution. The crucial question, and that was a question that was already asked to Darwin, is is it legitimate to extrapolate these tiny changes uh, that we find in, in the lab uh, in bacteria uh, uh, that have been cultivated for decades and, and they develop, let's say, as only new trait the ability to, to metabolize a certain substance that they couldn't metabolize in the wild before. Is it legitimate to extrapolate this over a long period of time, over millions of years, and say that explains how we get from bacteria to, to whales or to humans. And uh, the reason why it's not legitimate, in my opinion, is that in all those cases that have been shown in the lab, where you have either evolution of drug resistance or evolution of resistance against vaccinations or so on, what actually happens is not the origin of new information, of new genes, of new proteins, but the breaking of already existing information. So for example, you can get resistant against a certain poison if before you had the ability to metabolize the poison and therefore you get it inside your uh, metabolism and you die from it. And then you get a mutation that breaks this ability to metabolize this poison and then you are immune because it's not longer incorporated into your physiology. So all those cases where uh, something apparently uh, originates by microevolution in the lab is not new information but destruction of existing information or copying of existing information from other organisms by horizontal gene transfer, but not origin of really new traits of new information of new genes that would be necessary to explain how we get the first cell or different organisms in the first place. The next question, third question was, fossils showed that life started in simple forms, then increased in complexity. This proves evolution, right? Again, the answer is yes. It proves evolution, if, depending what you mean by evolution. Evolution can have a lot of different meanings. One meaning would be change over time. And nobody disputes that in different times in Earth history, different animals and plants existed. If you look at the Jurassic, you have dinosaurs today, no dinosaurs. If you look at the Cambrian, you have these weird Cambrian organisms and, and they don't exist today. So there's change over time. What indeed is true that if you look at the fossil record, and that, that is indeed a problem for, for a lot of uh, the so-called young earth explanations which explain the fossil record as a result of the global flood. What you find in the fossil record is a certain order. So it's not randomly distributed like in a catastrophe you would expect everything mixed together in large layers of mud. As Answers in Genesis said, uh, billions of dead things buried by water is uh, laid down in rock layers or something like that. So, but that's not what you find. What you find is a very sophisticated order where you can even use the fossil to, to indicate and predict what you will find uh, in the same layers because they are used uh, as so-called index fossils for, for the age of the rocks. And you find 
simple organisms at the beginning, down in the, the geological column, and more complex organisms up in the geological column. The, the more up you go in the geological column, the more similar the organisms are to our present plants and animals, the more down you go in the geological column, and the older you go, uh, the less similar they are. So there is a pattern that needs explanation, and it would not be true to say that common ancestry is no explanation. It is an explanation, it's actually a quite nice explanation for this pattern. The question is, is it the best explanation among several alternatives? And the alternative, for example, would be not common ancestry, but common design. And there has recently been a paper which has caused a lot of uh, debate uh, by a colleague of mine, Wes Muir, who is a software uh, guy and who uh, said we can explain this typical pattern, this hierarchical pattern of nested groups of similarity, this hierarchical pattern of appearance of groups over Earth history uh, by a certain design principle that every software engineer uh, uses and that is uh, so-called dependency graphs that you inherit, that you have certain templates and that these templates inherit their information and then you change just a little part and you do not start from scratch. So you use new mo modules. Every software engineer, uh, when he uses so-called object-oriented programming languages, uses program modules and then just modifies a little bit to give it a new function, but the rest is inherited from this module but it's not common ancestry, it's common design. So, the question is not, uh, is common ancestry no explanation? The question is, com is common ancestry the best explanation given all the evidence we have? And as we have seen, there is a lot of problems, at least with the Darwinian theory. So, uh, common design at least is on equal footing with uh, common ancestry to explain this pattern in the fossil record. But if we look at all other data, the, these problems for the origin of new proteins and so on, also problems to, to change the uh, embryonic uh, processes when a new uh, form of life should originate, because every change of the, the developmental processes of an organism usually lead to fatal cases where the organism dies and does not change into something else, then uh, the evidence gets much better for common design uh, and worse for common ancestry. So that would be my answer to this question. And the final question that I received by email is, can you explain the difference between theistic evolution and intelligent design? And um, if you want to really read a lot about this, we recently, uh, uh, me and my colleagues from Discovery Institute, participated in a large volume that addresses this question. It's not a volume about intelligent design, but it uh, is a volume about theistic evolution, and it's called Theistic Evolution, a thousand-page volume. And uh, theistic evolution is basically pushed by an organization called Biologos. Uh, they are Christians. Uh, but they are Christian who say uh, that uh, Darwinian evolution is correct. And the problem with this stance is that they make a self-contradictory claim. They claim that God guided this process, but that this process is unguided Darwinian evolution. So God guided an unguided process, which is a contradiction in itself, uh, either it's guided or it's unguided. So what they want to have is they want to have their cake and eat it too. Uh, they want to have Darwinian evolution, but they also want to have a God who is in a way involved. And they say, well, maybe he's involved, but it cannot be detected scientifically. But why should we assume this? We can just simply test this and can look at nature and can check the same methods that we use to detect intelligence for example, if we want to find out if a certain signal that we get from the stars is produced by a natural process, let's say by a quasar or a pulsar, by a star that gives regular uh, radio signals, or is, it, uh, is there some alien civilization setting us uh, the sequence of prime numbers? There are certain criteria that we can use to distinguish is a certain phenomenon caused by natural processes or is it ca caused by intelligence? If you find stones with carved texts on Mars, even if you cannot read the language, you can, can distinguish 
Is this pattern caused by the winds and the erosion on Mars, or is it caused by an alien civilization because it has a certain repetitive pattern and, and is clearly carved and not produced by, by natural processes? And why shouldn't we use the same kind of reasoning and look at biological nature and look, is in DNA some kind of code that clearly can only be originated by intelligence and not by natural processes? And therefore, theistic evolution is basically neo-Darwinism plus a gratuitous god uh, who cannot be detected and, and who didn't bother uh, if there are dinosaurs or uh, he is all-knowing and he's outside of time, so he knew in advance that it would lead to man, but basically he started this process and then in a kind of deistic way stayed either out of the process and waited till the uh, pre-known result happened or he guided it in a way that cannot be detected. That is theistic evolution. In my view, it doesn't really make sense and intelligent design is not religion. Yeah, contrary to theistic evolution, which is a religious hypothesis, intelligent design doesn't make a claim that we can, with scientific methods, identify who is the designer. Intelligent design, the evidence would be completely consistent uh, with the hypothesis that aliens did the, the intelligent design and there were alien uh, genetic engineers involved in the history of Earth. The question is, does it make sense? And does anybody believe in this? Actually, Richard Dawkins said, well, possibly I could imagine that this happened. This kind of intelligent design is quite fine for him. But if uh, the intelligent designer is God, no, 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 then it's of course uh, uh, superstition and nonsense, nonsense. So uh, intelligent design is a method to detect influence of intelligence as a cause for a certain pattern in nature. And then you need additional either philosophical arguments or theological arguments, revelation from scripture, if you want to identify the inferred intelligent designer, let's say, with the God of the Bible. And of course, we have independent evidence from natural theology that there is a monotheistic God, and we have the evidence, the historic evidence for the real the reliability of the Gospels, uh, that uh, it's the monotheistic God of Christianity. But that is not part of intelligent design theory. Intelligent design theory is a scientific theory. Everything that goes beyond that would be philosophy or theology. So that's my answer to this question, theistic evolution versus intelligent design. So of course, you're welcome to ask further questions. Now you have the chance to ask what you want. Um, well, we have many questions, but I know we are uh, short of time. so. Uh i just pick one question. You briefly talked about the very simple definition of evolution, the difference in gene frequencies. What, you be, what would be your definition of evolution if the one above is too loose? Did you get that? Yes. Yes, I got it. Uh, my definition of evolution is how do you get novel body plants, new organismal forms, how do you get from a single cell organism to something that looks like an archipod, like a trilobite, and how do you get from something that looks like a worm to something that looks like a mouse. So the great transitions, how do you get from something that looks like a pig to something that looks like a dolphin, or how do you get from something that looks like a squirrel to us. Uh, that is what we really mean when we think about the problem of evolution and not uh, the origin of drug resistance in some, okay. some microbes. So uh, I think the problem of evolution is macroevolution. That's what, what is interesting for us. Uh, Microevolution is uncontroversial and is more or less uninteresting. Of course, only those animals or, or organisms in a population that are best uh, equipped uh, survive and those that are less equipped uh, will rather die. And if you have two different genes in a population and one is advantageous and one is disadvantageous, of course, after a while, uh, one of these two genes will spread in the population and the other will decline. But that doesn't explain how the, where the genes came from and where the organisms came from. So my definition of evolution is where did it all came from and not just a change in gene frequency of genes we already have. 
Right. I have uh, one final question, which has been uh, repeated in a uh, few times. Uh, do you think um, proving intelligent design by exclusion is a strong enough proof? Uh, yes. As I explained, uh, the so-called Sherlock Holmes fallacy is only a fallacy if you happen to exclude all other options. So when you say, well, intelligent design wins by default, it's